two amazing things uh, in this story that you probably know. It's really familiar to you. If we read it from start to finish, verse uh, 17 down through 26, uh, it's the story of the, the men that come and they bring their, their uh, paralyzed friend and they let him down through the roof before Jesus. You've, you've probably heard it a million times. And so what I want to show you today, what I think the Lord is, was speaking to me this week was, as, we were, as I was studying this uh, passage for today, was there's two amazing things that you're going to see today. The first thing is go, you're going to see uh, it's an amazing thing about Jesus' authority. Uh, remember throughout this uh, text as we uh, last week we took a break and went to Genesis but as we've been walking through Luke we've just seen that Jesus is he's giving us uh, pictures of his authority remember he showed us that he he was he had authority in his word it says the people were astounded that he preached as one with authority in Nazareth and that's where they tried to kill him but he also had authority over spirits the spiritual world you saw that uh, over and over again so far in Luke where he just spoke a word and the spirit had to leave he had to obey immediately and he had authority over the physical world he rebuked a uh, fever of peter's mother-in-law and all of a sudden it was gone not all of a sudden but it, he commanded it to leave and it was gone he he had the authority over the physical world and that he could command fish to go into simon's net after he'd been toiling all night and caught nothing he had the authority he has the authority over the spiritual and the physical world where well, you're going to see something absolutely amazing today about his authority as he takes one further step toward uh, showing us who he is and one further step toward the cross, really. Today you're going to find out that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. Now, I know it's 2017 and me saying Jesus has authority to forgive sins. You've probably heard this passage. You've probably read through many passages of scripture. And when I say Jesus has the authority to forgive sins, all God's people say yawn. You're supposed to show me something that I don't know. You're supposed to show me something new to say that Jesus forgives sins. These, Jesus has this authority that, I mean, duh, I, I've heard that a million times. We've been here a bunch of times. Well, I want to show you today that in this text, in this passage, what he's showing us is it's absolutely amazing. It's, I mean, he is, he is going to actually claim in this section and, and throughout the rest of Luke, to be the one who possesses authority of forgiveness of your sin. To be God. And the people that are sitting around are going to be absolutely amazed. And this is, in fact, what's going to lead to him being crucified. It's going to lead to them chasing him down and plotting his destruction because he, they say he blasphemed, making himself equal to God. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. But to us, to a lot of people today, it doesn't seem like amazing. It seems like it's kind of old news, doesn't it? Seems like we've heard it a million times before and it's just, you know, it's kind of early. Don't get all excited. It's too early for all that. Just tell me what I'm supposed to learn. Teach me something new and let me go home. Well, that's the amazing thing that we're going to learn about ourselves. And I include me in it. Our, we are, there's something amazing about our tendency towards sin. And those are the two things we're going to learn. Uh, our tendency, that's our problem. Our problem is it always has to be something wonderfully new. I have to jump a little higher uh, this week than I did last week. I have to do a little better this week than I did last week. If you want to keep people entertained, keep people informed. Well, today what we're going to see is you're going to see something amazing about Jesus as he is the one who forgives sins. And we're also going to see something amazing about us, our proclivity, our all of our proclivity just to to go back to the where, where we came from. In this text, <clears throat> in verse 17, let me just read it. It says, And it came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, and that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed, <clears throat> a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before, before him, before Jesus. And verse 19 says, And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went out upon the housetop and let, down, let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Let me stop right there. We'll read the rest in just a minute. There's two kind of people in this story that come to Christ. Two kind of people that uh, that come to him. The first we see in is the the Pharisees and the doctors of the law. They'll be called scribes here in a little later. 
They're the religious folks. They didn't come. They came, it says in verse 17, came to pass on a certain day he was teaching. There were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. They came to hear Jesus, the Pharisees and the doctors of the law. And you know, you know that they didn't come in need They didn't come needing to be rescued or thinking that they needed to be rescued. They didn't come to uh, to uh, uh, have the power of Christ uh, uh, bring them to salvation or to help them with anything. Or, you know, at least this paralytic man is going to come knowing that he needs to be healed. They didn't come for any other reason. And we see this in other places. They come to examine him. They came because they were the religious guys. Now, a lot of times we think of the Pharisees, that, that word Pharisee, and what you, what the picture that uh, crops up in our mind is uh, uh, the guy with the long mustache that's twisting his mustache, and he's, uh, he's the evil guy that's plotting destruction, and the Pharisees indeed will plot Jesus' destruction before this is all said and done. But at this time, they're just the religious guys. That Jesus, the word is just getting out about his healings and his miracles. And they've heard these stories. And we saw last time he healed the leper and the leper. He told him, don't tell anyone, but go to the priest and show yourself to the priest. And we saw that the leper didn't obey what Jesus said. And he went and told everyone. And so Jesus couldn't go into the city. So all of these Pharisees, these doctors, these religious folks, they came out from every town of Galilee, every town around Jerusalem, and they wanted to see what was going on. They heard the stories about healings and they heard the stories about this one who preaches as though he has authority. And they heard about his telling them that the new era of salvation, the Messiah has come and proclaiming himself to be that Messiah as he did in Nazareth. And they came to examine it. They came to see if his deal is going to fit with their deal. Now, we're the religious guys. We're the religious guys, they would say. We're the ones that have access to forgiveness. We're the ones that have access to God. And if you want to come to God, you got to come through us. And so, therefore, they came to examine if this Jesus was on their team, if his, if his deal fit with their program, their identity. We don't know their names. We don't know who they are. Their identity was found in their own goodness, if you want to say it that way. Their idea was found in, you know, we are, we're right before God. They didn't come, they didn't come suffering. They didn't come knowing that they needed anything, although they did. They didn't come to be rescued. They didn't come to be delivered. They didn't come to be saved. They didn't come to be made right with God by this Messiah. They came to check out this teacher, do something good. Show me something. I've been hearing all this stuff about you. Show me something wonderful today. Oh, I've heard all this before. Show me something new. Show me something wonderful. Let's see if your deal fits with my program. If you teach anything that fits with my deal, with my program, I'll take that. But if it doesn't, you know, we're just really here to check you out and see how how it goes. They were the religious guys. And isn't really that how we all kind of start? Whether you're a raging atheist or whether you're just a religious man... Don't you, don't we all start that way? Just thinking, you know, I'm a pretty good person. God's going to be okay with me. I'm a pretty good guy. I don't do anything really wrong. That's the heart. That's the essence of the religious man that comes to Christ. But we see there's these other guys that also come. And these guys were just desperate. I mean, there's really no other way to describe them. They were desperate. You got the one who is I mean, we don't know anything about him. We don't know his name. We don't know whether he had brown hair and brown eyes or whether he was six foot five or five foot six. We don't know anything about him. He is identified solely based on his need. The man with the palsy. I mean, can you imagine that that's how he is known when you when you get to heaven and you go to uh, meeting all these people? He, I mean, you won't even know his name. Hey, he'll say, hey, I'm the man with the palsy. That's how he'll be known. The paralyzed guy. That's, that's all we know about him. He, he was desperate. Desperate. And then you got these other guys that are also desperate. And their desperation is just to get this guy to Jesus. To get him to this Messiah who's preaching and teaching. Who's healing and is able to deliver this man. These men are desperate. They're desperate for Christ. And there is nothing that's going to stand in their way. 
of getting to Christ. You've heard this many times before. They couldn't get in because of the crowd. They couldn't get in. And like so many today, they didn't say, you know, well, it's busy today. Let's come back tomorrow. Let's, uh, let's see if we can, you know, figure out another way. Maybe there's a doctor over a town over that can help you. No, they knew that Jesus was their only hope. They knew that if they didn't get to him, there was no redemption. There was no deliverance. There was no healing. And so you got these two different kinds of desperation. You got the one who knows his need and he knows I have got to get to Christ. And you got these other guys who know that this man is suffering and hurting and we have to get him to Christ. And so uh, during that time, the, the roofs were flat. There were staircases on the outside of the house. So it wasn't really a big deal for them just to bypass the front door, go up the staircase, get on the roof and start digging through the ceiling. You can imagine Jesus teaching and stuff starts falling in his hair. Whatever it was, plaster, mud, I don't know how they made them. But you can imagine what the guy who owned the house is screaming. Hey, quit digging in my roof, man. So they were desperate. They're going to do whatever it takes. They knew what the leper that we saw before found out was that Jesus is able. And they knew that Jesus is willing. Remember the leper that we talked about in Luke chapter five? He said, if you're willing, you can make me whole. You can heal me. And Jesus said, I'm willing. They knew what he had found out. So you got these two kinds of people that have come. You got you got these religious guys who are really just there to examine everything. They really don't need anything. They really don't recognize the fact that this is the one on whom I must depend to make me right with God. This is the one who has the forgiveness of sins. And then you got these other people that are nothing but desperate. They know that they don't have anything to offer Jesus. They don't have anything to bargain with. They're not there to make deals. They're not there. They are there simply to seek for grace and mercy. They're there to simply seek for deliverance and healing. Do you remember a time when you were desperate? You remember a time when you were desperate? You, you knew that you didn't have anything to offer Christ. You knew you didn't have anything to bargain with. You knew you didn't have anything to make a deal with him. You know, I'll tell you what, I'll give you this if you'll give me that. No, we come just like this paralytic man. With absolutely nothing. And the only thing that we want, the only thing that we desire is to be accepted in the presence of God. To be wrapped in the grace of God. To be given forgiveness. To be given His righteousness. You remember that desperation. But it doesn't take long before that kind of goes away, doesn't it? Doesn't take long before, you know, God saves you. Maybe God uh, redeems your, your heart. Maybe you give up some things that you were doing. And after a while, you know, I don't feel so bad. I don't feel like I'm such a bad person anymore. I don't feel like, uh, I don't feel like I'm, uh, doing really thing really wrong. I mean, I'm doing a whole lot better than I used to. And after a while, you're not desperately dependent on Christ anymore because why I'm doing good. I'm doing good before God. Now I'm not I'm not the same as I used to be. And that's a wonderful thing. It's by the grace of God that we're being sanctified. But, you know, it tends to make us think a little more highly of ourselves than we ought. And we start thinking, you know, I, I'm doing pretty good. But the reality is we're still desperately hopeless without Christ. We're still desperately without merit. We're still desperately in need without Christ. And so we as believers, I don't care, you know, if you've been a believer a year, 20 years, 50 years, you and I should still be desperately dependent upon Jesus Christ, upon who he is. And when you are dependent, when you are desperate for him, desperate to be in his presence, that's going to lead to you looking around and seeing the people around you and being desperate to get them to Jesus, to get them to Christ. You remember that desperation about your loved ones and your neighbors and your friends. And when you're not desperate for Christ, it's easy to say, well, you know, there's a lot of people in the door. We'll have to wait and come back another time. Now's not a good time. Let's do something else. Let's let's figure out another way. You know, you got to we can't just bust in the door and and and, and 
you know, get you. We, we've got to do something else. Let's, let's work around this deal. That's not what these men did. They dug straight through the roof. Messed up this guy's house. That desperation for Christ leads you to be desperate to bring others that are hurting. Others that are sinners. Others that are lost to Christ. But it doesn't take long when we think a little highly, more highly of ourselves than we ought before. That's also gone. And pretty soon, after a while, the amazing tendency of our heart is to go around thinking that we're doing pretty good. And everybody else... I hope they get there. But you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And so we don't go digging through any ruse. We don't go trying to get people to Christ. Now, you you and I, we say, no, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but that's not me. I'm I am dependent on Jesus. I am desperately dependent on Christ. Well, there's an easy way to test that. There's an easy way to tell. And so, man, y'all are quiet. Don't throw nothing at me. There's an easy way to tell. Because when you're desperate for Christ, boy, you'll have an active prayer life, won't you? When you're desperate, you will. Now, if you're not desperate, if you're just religious, it won't, it won't matter. Things can get in the way. You're not busy today. I got to cut the grass. I got to get this done. I got to get that done. We're going, you know, we're going out Friday night and so... We'll, we'll, we'll get to it. But when you're desperate, when you're desperate, oh, you'll have a prayer life. We were talking the other day, Brother Johnny and, and uh, Brother Eddie and myself, we were talking about, he was telling us about the electric, was the sprayer deals they have at the, the, you know, those things that shoot water on the farmland and they're all uh, mechanical, whatever. Have a, they have electric ones and, and they work really good. And he was telling us how amazing and wonderful they are. The only problem is if you touch it, you might die. Because it's shooting water everywhere and it's some electricity running through the thing. And he said, if you wave your hands in front of it and your hair stands up, you know, not to touch it. I'm thinking, forget that. You're risking your life every time you go to touch this thing, every time you go to push some buttons on it. And we thought, man, if that was your life day in, day out, I promise you, you'd have a good prayer life. Oh, you'd be praying every time you got ready to touch that thing. Because if you knew that this could be my last moment. I mean, touch this thing and if there's electricity running in the wrong place where it's not supposed to be running or if there's something malfunctioning, zap, you dead. Oh, you'll have an active prayer life. When you're desperate for his presence, desperate for him, you'll have you'll have an active prayer life. When when you're not, it'll be easy to wane. It'll be easy to say, you know, it's just busy. We a lot of things in the way. Good to agree. We you know. So it's an easy way to tell that. You're you're seeking him in scripture, seeking his word, having, you know, longing to have your mind renewed by the word. When you're desperate for him, you'll make time for it. You'll make time. I'm not saying, oh, this is the law and you got to spend at least an hour a day. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying when your heart is desperate, you'll long for it. When you're desperate, you can see it. It's easy to tell whether you're desperate or. Or whether you're just religious thinking, you know, I'm pretty good. I got it going on or whatever. It's easy to tell. You can look at your life for the last two weeks and say, am I desperate for Christ? Am I desperate to be in his presence? Or am I rocking right along like everything's just fine and it's all good? It's simple. It's easy to tell. Where, where do you go when you're desperate? You go to Christ. You can see it. it, it I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not rocket science. It's the reason why we see them all the time. People go out and they go and they do their own thing. And then when something really bad happens or a loved one gets an illness or somebody passes away or there's a need, what happens? It's happened in all of our lives. We've seen it in lots of other people. They come right back and they come to the altar and they go to crying out. Why? Because now they're desperate. Now they're desperate when the reality is that without Christ in every situation, whether you don't have any crisis looming over your head right now or not, you are desperate. You are desperately dependent on Christ for the forgiveness of your sin, for the righteousness in which God sees you and for the very breath that you breathe. You are desperately dependent on Christ. And when you recognize the fact that you're desperate, it's not work. 
to be devoted to Christ. It's not, it's not a struggle to maintain a closeness with him or to attempt to maintain a closeness to him. It's not a struggle to have a prayer life. It's not a struggle to seek him when you realize that you're desperate. And it just seems like he's showing us that over and over again. People ask, why does this bad thing happen? Well, if bad things didn't happen to me, I could promise you. I could promise you. We would all, we would all turn into these Pharisees. We would all turn into this religious guy. We would all turn into the, okay, I'm here. Show me something new. Tell me something wonderful. Give me a new principle to learn. Instead of coming like this, these men brought this paralytic and we're de- we just got to get in your presence. We're desperate just to get, get this guy before you. They were desperate for him. They were desperate. It's amazing to me how sinful, and I'm not just saying, oh, you're, you're a bunch of bad guys. I'm talking about all of us. It's amazing to me how sinful my own heart is when, when I have a need, when I know that something's going on. Oh, it's so easy. I'm going to start praying. I'm going to start calling out. I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to start doing that. And when everything's rocking right along, everything's wonderful. It's so easy just to let that fall in. That is amazing to me that our hearts are that wicked. But they are. And we're going to see something else here about Jesus' identity. The identity of these people that came basically is wrapped up in the religious identity. We don't know anything about them other than they thought they were good. They thought they were the, they were the guys that everything was fine. And these other guys, we don't know anything about them other than their identity was wrapped up in their need. They understood that they were desperate. They had to get to Jesus. And it says in verse 20, Jesus said, and when he saw their faith, he said unto him, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. That's, that's really strange if you're reading this. First of all, he, he, he sees not just the guy's faith, but all the, all the guys that had let him down through the roof. They believed so strongly that they were willing to rip up this guy's roof and get him to Christ. But the second thing was, it said in the very first verse that we read in verse 17, it said the power of the Lord was with him to heal. It said the Pharisees and the doctors of the law came and Jesus was teaching and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And this guy that needs healing is let down through the roof and dropped in Jesus's uh, right before Jesus. What are you expecting? You're expecting a healing. But instead, he says, man, your sins are forgiven. Now, to those listening, that's absolutely amazing. That is absolutely amazing. He he addressed, first of all, he addressed the real need of the man. The man, his real need was not just so he could walk again. His real need was that he needed to be forgiven, that his sins had separated him from an angry God and that there was no reconciliation where there was sin standing in the way. So he needed to be forgiven. If Jesus put out his hand and touched this man and healed him right on the spot, which we've seen him do already in Luke, the man's going to die again. I say again, the man's going to get sick again and eventually he's going to die It's 2017. He did die. He could heal him. And the man walks off wonderfully glad that he's been healed. His legs are now strong. He can have a life. He can go and do whatever he wants to do. But there's still coming a day when death will find him. And if sins aren't dealt with, the end of that situation will be a whole lot worse than the beginning. So he says, man, your sins are forgiven. He has the authority. He's basically saying, I have the authority to forgive sin. We've seen his authority shown in lots of different areas. But here he steps out and says, basically, I'm God. And it's not lost on the people sitting around. In verse 21, it says, the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this? Who does this guy think he is, which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? They understood exactly what he was saying. He was saying something amazing. 
He was saying that he has the authority to forgive sin. Who can, for, who can forgive sin but God alone? They were absolutely right. Theologically, they were right. The only, the only one who can forgive sins is God. So they were right. But where they were wrong was that God, the Son, was standing right in front of them and did have the authority and does still today have the authority to forgive sins. Those whom he forgives are forgiven and they're forgiven eternally. So it's possible for you and I today, if we fall into this religious category where we're not in need, we're not desperate for Christ. It's possible for us to be theologically right about a lot of different things, but miss Jesus, miss being in relationship with him, miss coming to know him. But we got all the answers. We're theologically right about a lot of things. We understand a lot of deals. But they missed the biggest point that God the Son was standing right in front of them. And he was offering forgiveness of sins. They said, who is this guy that thinks that thinks he can forgive sins? Well, Jesus is going to demonstrate that authority as we wind this thing up. He says, when Jesus perceived their thoughts, there's your first indication that he's God. He answered, said unto them, what reason ye in your hearts? He says, why are, you, why are you speaking like this in your hearts? Why are you thinking this way? He said, whether it's easier to say, make sure you understand that, see that, to say, it's easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up and walk. He says, is it easier to say, man, your sins are forgiven, or is it easier to say, get up and walk? To be honest, it's a whole lot easier to say, you know what? My sin, your sins are forgiven. Why? Because you can't prove it. <clears throat> you can't disprove it. I mean, shoot, I can say it from right here. Brother Chris, your sins are forgiven. Who's going to deny it? Who can prove it? Who can falsify it? You can't prove it. It's easy to say your sins are forgiven. It's a whole lot harder to say to a paralytic, get up and walk, because you can prove whether that's going to happen or not. You can see the evidence of whether that's going to happen or not. And so he says, is it easier to say <clears throat> your sins are forgiven <clears throat> or is it easier to say, get up and walk? And then he says, and make sure you understand this. Verse 24 says, but that you may know that the son of man hath power upon the earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy couch and go into thine house. Why did he heal the man? So that you would know that he has authority to forgive sins. This was a sign, a sign of his authority to forgive sins. I, it's almost like, I mean, it's almost like the, the healing part is an afterthought. I mean, I'm sure it's not, but it's almost like, okay, so this guy gets lowered down through the roof and the power of the Lord is there to heal and he, he's lowered down and all the people are expecting a healing and Jesus, instead of saying, man, be healed, he says, your sins are forgiven. And it's, I mean, it, it, just in my mind, I'm imagining this, but it, it's almost like Jesus walks off and says, okay, there you go. Sins are forgiven. Good job. And then he perceives everybody around saying, he can't do that. He can't forgive people. Say, Only God can do it. Well, who does this guy think he is? And he says, okay, so to prove to you my authority to forgive sins, I'm going to go ahead and heal him too. And he says, but that you may know that the son of man hath power upon earth to forgive sin. That son of man, he, this is one of Jesus' favorite names for himself. He calls himself the son of man over and over again. And that goes back to Daniel chapter 7. Where Daniel in his vision says in Daniel chapter 7, I saw one like a son of man who ascended to the ancient of days and was given a kingdom and power and authority that was everlasting. He used the same phrase and pointed to the same text at his trial where he said, he said, I am him and you will see the son of man coming on the clouds seated at the right hand of power. That's what he was talking about was Daniel chapter seven. And when he said that, the Pharisees tore their robes and says, we don't need any more witnesses. This guy's made himself out to be God. <clears throat> he said, 
so that you would know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. I say unto thee, arise, take up thy couch, thy bed, the mat that he was on, and walk. And verse 25 says, and immediately he rose up before them, took up that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things, strange things indeed today. It's easier to say, this is what I want you to say. It's easier to say your sins are forgiven than it is to say get up and walk. Because as we're sitting here, you can't prove whether your sins are forgiven. You can't disprove that your sins are forgiven. But I want to show you that it is infinitely harder for God, God the Son, to forgive sin than it is to heal a man from leprosy or being paralyzed see we've seen that over and over again this miracle of healing is not new in luke's gospel he's already healed quite a few people it said uh, right after the the first deal it said that many people from all over brought them their sick and their infirmed and he healed them all and he drove out evil spirits drove out demons from people we've seen it already in luke's gospel so this is not a new thing his healing. And we saw how he has authority to heal. He doesn't do a dance and and give some medicine and shake or or whatever. He just speaks and it's gone. The leper comes, bows down before him, said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. He touches him and said, I'm willing. Poof. I added the poof, by the way. He's clean, healed. It's not a big stretch for the God of the universe who created all things to speak a word and create anything or to bring healing or to cure disease. It's not a big deal. But in order to forgive your sin, he couldn't just speak a word. He had to come as a man. He had to give his body to be beaten. He had to surrender himself to be nailed to a cross. And the most horrible part of it all, he had to receive the wrath and punishment of God the Father for the sins of the world. He had to offer himself as a sacrifice. He had to come and and be nailed to a cross. He had to come and as while he was hanging on the cross and he had to struggle for each breath. As he was hanging there, and that's how people who were crucified died, by suffocation. They would push up to breathe, and then they would let off to let their breath out, and that's why their legs were broken if they wanted to hurry up the process. When your legs are broken, you can't push up anymore. You just suffocate to death. As he was hanging on the cross, he had to do that in order to forgive your sin. Because God's law, God's justice must be satisfied. It mu- God is a perfect judge. He is a good father. He's not going to let any wickedness go unpunished. The only question today is, are you going to take the punishment for your wickedness or my wickedness? Or is Jesus going to take it on the cross? It's easy. It's easy to say, man, your sins are forgiven. It's easy for us to think, you know what? I'm all good because my sins have been forgiven. <laughs> Let's eat, drink, and be merry and have a good time and not worry about anything because my sins are forgiven. But it's a whole different ballgame when you realize that in order for your sins to be forgiven, you have to be dependent upon this Christ. You have to be in fellowship with this Christ. You have to be in relationship with this Christ because he is the one that paid for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you are not united with him in his death and his burial and his resurrection, then you have no forgiveness of sins. Zero. You and I today, if you've been saved 50 years or if you've been saved a day, you and I are still desperately dependent upon Christ. We're still desperate. Longing for him to be in his presence, to get to where he is at. And that's really the issue. That's really the issue. 
The amazing thing is Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. He has the authority to forgive your sins. He has the authority to make you whole. He has the authority, as we've seen over and over again, to bring in the kingdom of God as it, as it step by step is destroying the kingdom of the curse that has come about because of the fall. He has the authority. He has the power to forgive sin. And woe to the one who calls himself Christian that takes that for granted, gets used to it, lives as if, eh, it's no big deal. Teach me something new. Show me some new principles. Woe to the man or woman who has gotten used, so used to God, so used to religious things, so used to sin, that seeking Christ in prayer is no longer important. Seeking Christ in his word is no longer important. Seeking Christ in the fellowship of his church, his bride, is no longer important. Woe to that man. It's a symptom of the real problem. I'm not saying, hey, uh, if you start praying again and you start reading your Bible again, you start coming to church again, everything's going to be fine. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that's a symptom of the real problem. The real problem is sin. And until it's dealt with, you're going to keep falling in the same pothole you've been falling into over and over again. You're going to keep bumping your head up against the same wall that you've been bumping it up against over and over and over again. I know you I know we've heard it before. We've heard it time and time again. But the reality is if if a man came <clears throat> man, if a man came up to you with a big red sore on his forehead. I mean just big pussy, oozy, red thing. And he says, I need your help. I don't know what's wrong. I've got this thing on me. I don't know where it came from. I need your help. And you said, okay, well, I'll tell you what. <clears throat> Let me just follow you around and watch you and see what might be causing this. And every hour on the hour, when the, when the clock chimed, you watched the guy walked over to the wall and busted his head up against the wall you might say, I think I know your problem. Every hour on the hour when the clock chimes, you go over and you knock your head against the wall. That's where that big red sore is coming from. And the guy said, well, that's, that's not my problem. That's not it. No, it's got to be something else. You'd think, what an idiot. <laughs> well, just keep knocking your head against the wall. Then, duh. The reality of our problem is sin. I know you've heard it before. I've heard it before. I keep falling to the same things you fall into. I keep going to the same deals that you keep going to. I, we have the amazing tendency to start being self-reliant. Even though we know we can't be self-reliant, we must be dependent. So Jesus has this amazing authority to forgive sins. And we have this amazing ability to delude ourselves into thinking that we're independent and that everything's okay. The reality is that you and I have to be desperate for him. And if you're not desperate for him, then you need to ask some hard questions about who you are and about who he is to you. Today, he offers you the same forgiveness, the same forgiveness that we preach every Sunday, the same forgiveness that this scripture is going to show you every time you open it up. He offers it to you. If you would repent of your sin and you trust in Christ, that he died for your sin and that he is enough to give you the righteousness of God and to make you holy and blameless before the Father, if you would trust in that provision he has given, he'll save you. I know it's old news. I know it's something you've heard before. But you need it today just as much as you ever have. And if you're a saved person, born again by the Spirit of God, you still need it. You need the righteousness of Christ. You need union with Him. You need to be desperate to get into His presence because He's the vine and you're the branches. And He said, you can't do anything without me. So come to him today. Lord, we love you and we thank you, God. We thank you for your word. Thank you for what you've given.